You're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 260. I just started playing around. And then people started asking me for, like, hey, can I get some more? My, you know, my grandmother, my dog even. I couldn't believe it. Attention, gifters, bakers, crafters, and makers. Pursuing your dream can be fun. Whether you have an established business or are looking to start one now, you are in the right place. This is Gift Biz Unwrapped, helping you turn your skill into a flourishing business. Join us for an episode packed full of invaluable guidance, resources, and the support you need to grow your gift biz. Here is your host, gift biz gal, Sue Monheit. Well, hi there. It's Sue. And as always, thanks for joining me here today. Boy, it's feeling so different right now with this worldwide pandemic. More than ever, we need to be in control of our lives. That's the fabulous thing about owning your own business. Whether it's full-time or for some extra money on the side, having a business offers you options and has been the saving grace for many. Given that, if you don't already know, and you're hearing this just for the first time, my business development program, Makers MBA, is closing enrollment tomorrow night. That's Tuesday, March 31st. So you still have a tiny bit of time to join in. How do you know if this program is right for you? If you've been dreaming of starting your own handmade business, but it's felt too time-consuming, overwhelming, or scary, and you're just not sure what steps to take, this is for you. If you've started your business, but you're frustrated and anxious because it's not bringing in the sales you expected, and you're not sure what to do to turn things around, then this program is also for you. We work together for four and a half months, and in the end, you'll have a business that's set up properly. You'll know all the components and actions that go into owning a business that will thrive, and you'll have access to refer back to all the information as your business grows and changes. It's the only place I do hot seat coaching, so we work on your specific issues. This is not an old-fashioned type lecture class. You learn and then apply what's right for you based on where you are in your own business creation. And no, a prior business degree is not required. If you're a gifter, baker, crafter, or maker, and you're serious about starting or growing your handmade product business, then go to giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash makers MBA for all the details. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, I'm only offering it one time this year. So this is your only chance and enrollment ends tomorrow. That link again is giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash makers MBA. And if by chance you miss it, this same link will jump over to a wait list so you can be notified for next year. Moving on, I'm really excited to share with you our show today. I think everyone has a preconceived notion of what CBD oil is and or how it can help you. But there are a lot of misconceptions out there. So you get to learn the truth about this product, one that continues to gain in popularity. Plus, with the extra challenges that CBD products face, Derek shares what has worked for him in terms of product receptivity and sales. These overall strategies can be tweaked and put to use in your business too. So, are you ready to learn all about CBD? Today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Derek Spurl. Derek is the co-owner of Cherry Blossom CBD. They're a Maryland-based wholesaler and distributor of industrial hemp with an exclusive retail line of hemp-based products. His innovative line of nutraceutical supplements are all made from American-grown and organically processed hemp and independently lab-tested. These products are naturally helping people find relief of pain, inflammation, anxiety, as well as a host of other ailments. Oh my gosh, Derek, we need you so much. Welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Thank you for having me this morning. I'm glad to be here. How are you today? I'm good. We were supposed to get a big snowstorm here today, and we only got a little measly snowstorm. Is that good news or is that bad news? That's bad news in my book. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) The more snow, the better for me. Right. We haven't had a snow day, I don't know, two years maybe here. Oh my gosh. 
I know. And like, we really need one. You just need to be snowed in sometimes and just hang out with the TV and a good pot of soup. For sure. But probably the amount of snow we got here would have qualified with you for a snow day. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, they probably keep schools open for what we get. Right, for sure. (laughs) For sure. Derek, seriously, enough about me. We are going to talk about you now. (laughs) and We're going to do it in a little bit of a traditional way that I have on the show here. And that is to have you describe yourself by way of a motivational candle. So if you were to create a candle that speaks all you, what color would it be? And what would be a quote on the candle? What color would it be? I have a clear candle and the clear candle is for a reason. I'd like to say I've learned some very good lessons in my life. And most of the lessons I've learned is by learning from other people. And that clear candle would say life is all about perspective. Be open to seeing others. That has been something that even when before all of this happened, I was a chef back in the day. And I used to say this a lot to my staff and my line cooks. Like, look, we are all different people from different walks of life with different perspectives. And they're all very real. So just try to stand in the other shoes every now and then, and you never know what you just might see. Yeah, and be open to other people's experiences and learning, and don't assume that your view of reality is the only view. Exactly. Sometimes that's hard to do, of course. We're all humans, but I think if you at least try, if you get a 50%, I think you're doing good. (laughs) Yeah, just being open. You're so right. I love that. Okay, candle accepted, check mark. Thank you. (laughs) So you just alluded to being a chef. Take us back and give us a little history of where you've been before Cherry Blossom. Well, I guess when I was a young kid, I had somehow, some way, cooking got it to me. I was uh, raised by my mother and my grandmother until I was about five. And then then my mother got married. And they, you know, they were, you know, were young in the early 80s and they were working a lot. So what, what happens, I just have to come home and latch key kid. And I, I don't know if they can even do that anymore. But and I figure out how to cook for myself. And this all led to me just wanting to learn more and wanting to learn more and wanting to learn more. So sometime in my 20s, I went to culinary school here in the D.C. area. It was called Academy de Cuisine or No Clothes, but they were taught like classic French cuisine. And I worked a lot, like more like classic French kitchens and some of the old guard kind of chefs. And it was good. Those were good times. And I think what that has prepared me for what is happening in my life right now in a lot of ways. Our business, our industry is a chaos. And just by the nature of the restaurant industry, it's sort of chaotic every day. I don't know if by design, it's just the way it is. But I've kind of learned to work in a little bit of chaos and a little dysfunction. And unfortunately, the CBD industry right now, without tight rules and regulations and things like that, it's kind of a wild, wild west. So that has prepared me in that way, but also as far as like formulating and production and things like that, organization, it's all helped team building. We have a small team, but I think we're all very close and we're all on the same page. So that chef foundation, those, the crossing T's and dotting I's and the minutia of doing what you have to do to be successful has really helped what we are trying to accomplish today. I'm really glad you bring that up because we have a lot of listeners who are thinking of maybe turning a hobby or a craft into a business. And right now they're working somewhere else. Maybe they're in a bank or they're working a retail shop or a multitude of different things. Or maybe they're a stay-at-home mom, right? And your conversation here about how a totally different industry, you were still picking up skills, ways of managing through things, and knowledge that now you can apply on top of what you're doing today. So that's an excellent example. And I want all of you listeners to hear that because whatever you're doing today is not wasted time. Observe what you're learning and take in as much as you can. Like I tell everybody, Derek, like volunteer for any committees your business is putting together because you're getting more connections, right? You're meeting more people. You're picking up additional skills, additional resources. I mean, you just never know where some of this might play out and be beneficial for you in the future. You want to put yourself in the path of where you're going. But at the same time, sometimes it's like networking. Like You always got this, I don't want to go this networking thing. But you go and that those are the times that you actually meet someone who helps extend your career a little bit or helps you see things in a different way that ends up you sort of embracing it like, oh, OK, like I, that never would have happened. This relationship never would have happened that I had not just and, and gone to this networking event and sort of like working and kind of experiencing things in that way is the same way. You just never know what's going to happen. You never know what skills that you're sort of putting in reserve or you may put in the back of your mind that come back to help you in your chosen path. Yep. Agree with you 100 percent. All right. So tell us now about Cherry Blossom and where the idea came from. So bring us back way to the beginning before you'd even started. How did this become an idea in the first place? Well, this is interesting because kind of a funny conversation. And at first I didn't really want to tell people about it, but it's kind of started as 
I had left the restaurant business and I was trying to figure some things out and I kind of knew that I didn't want to work for anyone else. That has always been my goal to work for myself. So I started playing around, the laws changed in D.C. here, and I started playing around actually with different concentrates that I could find. But most of them were, were THC-based, to be perfectly honest. And I started handing them out to my friends, you know, like here, and just playing with different you know, confectionery techniques and things. So my friends like, you're onto something here. Like, you know, I'm giving this to my grandmother. It worked for her and, and her, whatever, her knee pain. Okay, wait. So were you baking, were they food-related items or? They were food-related items. I was making confections. I was making candies and cookies and things like that and just handing them out to people. You were handing them out to people who had some type of ailments. Like, more detail, please. (laughs) It was more just like, I just wanted to see if what I was doing was actually working. Were my techniques working? They were just my guinea pig. And what they were telling us, what they're telling me were these success stories in a way. So, okay, I might be on to something here. How did you find out, did you do research or were you exposed to this? Or how did you get the idea of doing any testing in the first place? Well, we have very funny laws here in the District of Columbia. I like the way you word that. (laughs) It's funny because it's not quite legal. It's not quite illegal. It's a very gray space. Mm. So you can gift or trade cannabis and products to anyone you wanted. So I just started playing around and then people started asking me for like, hey, can I get some more? My, you know, my grandmother, my dog, even like dogs eating cats. I couldn't believe it. So I talked to a friend of mine. I said, okay, maybe we could figure something out with this. Maybe we can try to get some sort of license to Maryland's changing and DC's changing. They weren't really changing fast enough as it turns out. So as we were networking, we met the lady who runs the Maryland Cannabis Commission. And I said, well, you know, when, do you know when you're going to allow edibles? Like we'd like to get throw our hat in the ring. And her answer to us was, I have no idea. It could be six months. It could be six years. And I'm like, well, that's a little discouraging. Right. You can't build a business around that. Yeah, I can't build a business around that. But what I did see that there was opportunities in the CBD market. And what changed our mind is that we actually went to the candy show in, what was it? That was in uh, Hershey last September. Oh, no, two Septembers ago. We walked out of there and we realized that because our intent was to go there to start figuring out how to be candy manufacturers. And what I realized is that there were a lot of candy manufacturers there, of course, but that were a lot better than we were that had been doing this a lot longer, a lot more skilled, multi-generational family businesses. And on the way home, we just started talking and the light bulb came on and like, maybe we shouldn't try to compete with these businesses. Maybe we should try to work with them and find something that can work with them and maybe sell to them. That it was kind of the initial thought that we would just uh, kind of like sell like bulk oils and things like that. We went to California. We started meeting with different processors and things. And as it turns out, like, well, oh, well, we have this and we have this and we have this. And we started working with these guys and we came up with a cherry blossom line of products. And we're looking for a name. My mother came up with a name. I said, I wanted something more like DC, but didn't say DC. And she said, well, how about cherry blossom? I said, OK, that works. Yeah, because it relates, but it's still open enough. It's broad It's enough. still open enough. Exactly. Sometimes when you're labeling your business and you say, well, we're Highland Park Auto, it's hard for you to, to expand out of that because now the world knows us as this. Right. Like you're not going to be in Detroit and be called Highland Park Auto. Exactly. Right. So thinking ahead about that. And then the blessing, I thought, was my business partner, Larry, and he came up with this logo. And I, he kind of ducked himself out for a couple of days and resurfaced. And all of a sudden, like, this thing is, I'm like, wow, like, this is beautiful. And, you know, and the guy in me was like, I don't know if I can go around representing this pink logo, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure you can. It's almost a door opener in a way, because people look over and they see these two middle-aged guys who are. Not exactly chiseled, you know what I mean? Yeah, but so, And they see this big old pink thing behind us and they can't quite figure it out. It makes people want to come up and talk to us just to see like what the heck is going on. That's not the only reason they want to come talk to you. Your booth is lively and fun. You're very energetic and it's just it's a happy place to be. And the logo is happy too. So it all comes together. Can I do a fact check here real quick? Yeah, certainly. So you were initially testing multiple ingredients and seeing results. And then you narrowed in and settled on CBD because you saw potential to be able to build a business on it just based on all of the laws that are around. 
the laws and also I looked at usage and where usage is right now with CBD. There's a lot of miseducation and a lot of question marks in people's minds. But I knew that on the long term, even though people say that cannabis is going to be a bigger business, I believe that more people can and will use hemp-based products because not everybody wants to, the psychoactive effect. I think more people will appreciate not having psychoactive effect than to have any psychoactive effect. Okay. So talk with us about all of this. What is CBD? What are the effects? Share with us as someone who may not know. So you can get CBD for, from basically two sources. You can get it from cannabis plants that happen to have certain strains that happen to be high in CBD, or you could get it from hemp plants, which are naturally high in CBD and low in THC. So I'll say that a different way. Cannabis plants tend to be more THC abundant. Hemp plants tend to be more CBD abundant. So it is a better source, or at least a better resource to get CBD from hemp plants because it's abundant in it. So most people don't know this, I think. I think most people think they're sort of one and the same. And, and the way I explain it to people is that if we were all taking a walk through the grocery store on a mission to get citrus, we're going to make a citrus pie. Like how many types of citrus are we going to get? How many types of citrus are available to us today? Well, there's lemons, there's limes, there's grapefruit, there's oranges. And we all understand that these things are in the same family. They are all in the citrus family, but they're different colors. They're different tastes. Sometimes they're even different textures. We utilize them differently in our home kitchens. We may not even utilize them in the kitchen. We may use it for something else totally all together, maybe for fragrances or what have you. But we kind of can wrap our heads around that all these different fruits are citrus fruits and they come from the same family, but they may do different things. That's how we have to look at these two plants here. They're sort of like kissing cousins. They're in the same family. Yes. They're almost named the same thing with the exception of maybe an L. Like I think it's a hemp is like cannabis sativa L. So they are very much related, but they do different things. And we're looking to the hemp plant because it's an ancient botanical that's been helping people for millennia, millions of years. People who have been in grace this earth long before you and I were ever even thought of have been using this medicinally to heal themselves naturally, to alleviate pain, to alleviate anxiety, mood-related disorders, inflammation in particular, where a lot of times it's tied to pain, which is a very interesting conversation in 2020 and what we've seen in the last 20 years and the options that people have been given to handle their pain. Right. Because I think like as you're telling the story, I'm thinking, OK, yes, this has been around for a long time. But in the recent, I'm going to call it century, everyone's gone to man-made chemicals, I guess it is, for pain relief in many cases. And now there's become more of popularity or whatever, the switch back to all the natural remedies. I think sometimes tragedy has to happen for people to change perspective. Oh, so the century is a tragedy, a medicine. I'm not calling it a tragedy, (laughs) but what we're looking at right now, I think if every one of us could probably say that we know someone who has been negatively impacted by opioids in our family or in our community. The fact that everyone in the United States could probably say that is pretty tragic to me, yeah. When something has been available to us this entire time that can help and heal and not have any negative impact on you. Right. Unless you're taking sort of blood thinners. I mean, it does kind of sometimes increase the heart rate some. So people who take blood thinners, they may want to, anybody may want to consult your doctor before you choose any any supplements or products, but especially those on blood thinners. So you tested out the product with samples and you saw that indeed this was producing relief or healing results, whatever it was. Then you went to the show And you saw that, well, maybe I don't want to be making candy. I want to be providing a product for all these generations or established businesses to be able to use our product in their business. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I think you said you were at the Philly Candy Show for the first time two Septembers ago. So September of 2018. And that's where you made this discovery and change? We changed there, and by that November, we had already we met out to California a couple of times. We met with some different producers and manufacturers, and we needed people who sort of understood our vision and, for lack of a better word, our standards. We, we were looking for certain things. We were looking for full-spectrum products. We believe in the totality of cannabinoids and terpenes and flavonoids, which are all the components that are truly helping people inside this plant, and we wanted them all present. I myself have been using these hemp-based products for quite some time because I've had knee problems and back problems and things like that. 
And I was always too afraid to go the pharmaceutical route. I like natural products. I'd rather take my chances with what nature has given me than what the pharmaceutical companies have given me. So it was just a natural plug-in for me because it was part of our belief system. Getting it to other people to believe it sometimes is a little more challenging, but because of the different stigmas and things, but it's happening. I think people are seeing that these nature-made supplements can really heal us. And I think that we've been fooled for a long time into believing that this is the gateway and these things are taking people up into the primrose path, but because of all the things that have been tied to marijuana. I think people don't know this, but hemp was grown pretty prevalently here in the United States, colonial times, up probably up until about the 1800s, for multitude of reasons, not just for the cannabinoids and terpenes, but for all sorts of industrial reasons. So let's stick with product development for a minute here. So you never, if I'm understanding correctly, were producing it just locally and selling. You went to factories to produce it right away. We wanted to focus on selling. Okay, so how did you find, and and I'm just thinking of someone who's not looking at a product like yours, but has an idea, wants to go direct to factories. How does one do this? How do you search out factories and then go and analyze which one you're actually going to do business with? Take us through a little bit of that. Some of it was actually pure luck. It was one or two relationships that, that led us to some hedge fund guy that I probably never would have met. And he took me out to lunch. And it was all, the way I felt about it, it was almost like a qualifier. Like, you know, is this guy qualified to work with this kind of deal? Like, okay, so. Qualifier on their end or your end? Yeah, like on their end. They're making sure that, I don't know, like, are you worthy kind of deal. And I, <laughs> at least they never said that, but that's the, that's the impression I walked away with. They need to know too, right? Yeah, they did. Yeah. And next thing you know, you know someone was calling me from this company and you're like, hey, let's meet. And we went out and we met, we sampled their products, we met their scientists. And we've actually gotten very close since then and are doing a few more things together. They're helping us formulate and they're actually encouraging us to do something similar here on the East Coast. So sooner or later, we'd like to get a processing facility of ourselves going on the East Coast so we can offer East Coast businesses some of the benefits that the West Coast businesses have, you know, as far as pricing and things like that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you have a lot going on there. We're trying. You said it's happened kind of by accident, but I would suggest not because we were talking just a little earlier about networking and connections and how one thing leads to another. And it's still the unknown when you start talking with someone, you just don't know where that can lead. just don't know. And sometimes the least obvious are the most beneficial based on what you're doing. I mean, I believe in law of attraction and I kind of feel like that happens all the time. I don't know an answer and then I meet someone who provides me an answer. It's funny because it's another one of those skills that I picked up in the restaurant business. I, I had not just cooked. I had done other things. You know, we've done catering. I've done waiting tables, bartending, things like that. And some of the sayings that we have is like, you know, you always, especially when you're in the front of the house, you don't know who those people are coming through that door. You don't know how important they are, what their position is in the community. I mean, they could be the minister of the biggest church in the community that, you know, that's, that's providing all kind of, you know, whatever. You just don't know. Just because they're in shorts and a t-shirt doesn't mean anything. Just because they're in shorts and a t-shirt and they're there to eat, they're there on a different mission, they're not there professionally. But you always have to be ready to put your best foot forward, whether that be when you're communicating with people, the work that you're doing, you know, when you're standing behind that booth, because you just don't know. You just don't know. Right. Okay. So now you have your factory and you're working with scientists and all of that. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you, would you say, till you landed on the product specifically? (laughs) I think we knew when we met them, this is the, the company that we were working with. The longest part of it is really has been the design, like label design. Even the legal stuff didn't take as long. I don't know. Maybe label design isn't as important to some, but it seems like if anyone has designed labels before, and speaking from my own experience, it took us about eight, nine months to get this right. We're actually redoing them now because we weren't satisfied with them. I totally underestimated how much time and energy it takes. But if you think about like that is your first introduction to people, that's your first impression to your customers, it does make sense to take that much time to do it. So I know your bottles. You've got the brown bottles Mm -hmm. with a very beautiful label. And Gift Biz listeners, you'll be able to go over to their website and see the logo anytime you want. But it's beautiful. It's what you would expect. Cherry blossoms, you know, the pink cherry blossoms with some green. Beautiful, beautiful. I love it. Thank you. How is it that you've decided that you need to do a change? Is it just an intuitive feel or you're seeing some responses or some confusion from people who are coming and interacting with you at a show or what's led you to this? Your business tells you things. It tells you what moves to make. 
if you're listening, it will tell you which way to go and which way not to go. So what were you told? We're going to hear more of Derek's product development story right after a quick word from our sponsor. Yes, it's possible. Increase your sales without adding a single customer. How you ask? By offering personalization with your products. Wrap a cake box with a ribbon saying, happy 30th birthday, Annie. Or add a special message and date to wedding or party favors for an extra meaningful touch. Where else can you get customization with a creatively spelled name or fine packaging that includes a saying whose meaning is known to a select two? Not only are customers willing to pay for these special touches, they'll tell their friends and word will spread about your company and products. You can create personalized ribbons and labels in seconds. Make just one or thousands without waiting weeks or having to spend money to order yards and yards. Print words in any language or font. Add logos, images, even photos. Perfect for branding or adding ingredient and flavor labels too. For more information, go to theribbonprintcompany.com. The business was telling me that we made some mistakes early on, that we made some mistakes in the sense that we underestimated how important having non-THC products were in a DC market full of government employees. But we have less than the federal amount, but we do have trace amounts of THC in our products. And for a group of people who are getting tested on a regular basis or have the potential to, they're not as interested in buying those products. They want stuff that is more broad spectrum or have no THC in them. So that was one lesson. It's not that we're not selling them, but I think that we would have more success if we had things that had zero THC. So there's going to be an extension to the line or a revamp of the line? That's kind of what we're thinking about right now. I do believe in what we're doing. And sometimes I think that is kind of like the crux of what we deal with as a business owner, like what I believe or what my initial vision was to what my business is telling me. Interesting. Well, and you have to be open to it too, because someone could be so bullheaded. I say that in a loving way, maybe <laughs> yeah. like where they're just not going to have their eyes open to all the signs around them. And this, what you're talking about is a great example of watching what everyone's telling you. You stick to your guns to a degree, but you cannot necessarily get stuck to your initial vision because things change. The environment changes. Like what you're doing now can't be exactly what you were doing in 2007. Things have changed. We've all had to make minor changes since then. Even if it's something as small as the way we communicate, we might have been more desk phone people then, but now we're cell phone people. So things change and you have to adapt. And what the changes were telling me is that we are in a crowded field. Even in this market, there's a lot of CBD brands out there. There's a lot of confusion and people just, well, I see CBD at the, the grocery store. I've seen it at doctor's office. I've seen it at the gas station, at the convenience store. It's all the same. And I think people need to know that it's not all the same. That there are different levels to it. There are different levels of extraction. There are different levels of carrier oil. So all these things kind of go in place to represent the standards of quality and price point. What we saw, it didn't really matter because there was so much out there that's confusing people. And we need to figure out how to differentiate ourselves. So what we started doing is putting ourselves more in a wholesaler distributor position as opposed to just being another retail line. It separates us and what we're trying to do now, what we have been doing, is talking to businesses about helping them use their branding and their existing marketing with our products so they can create their own brand of CBD. And I think that's more powerful for people than what I'm seeing. People are more interested in today's age in branding themselves than necessarily, I just want to carry your line of products. Sure. So when you're talking wholesale, then I think you're still talking two different things. You're talking wholesale to businesses who then want to private label their product and sell CBD through their channels. And then you're still also looking at providing CBD for the consumable field? The manufacturers, Manu producers. Yeah, so both, but all virtually wholesale. All wholesale. Bulk isolates, you can get bulk oils, you can get bulk gummies if you want them in the container. Unlabeled, you can have them that way. If you want them with our label on them and you want to sell our products, we can do that for you too. If you need bulk isolates. So we're looking at bigger businesses and understand that people aren't just wanting to put things on their shelves, but they're wanting to take some of these derivatives and add it to what they're already doing, uh, which is the original reason we, sort of, we went back to the candy show. Hey, this is what we're doing now. We're having products that we're offering products that you can put into what you're doing and create a whole different line of income for yourselves and extend your brand as well in your particular market. And it feels better. It's sitting well with you, it sounds like. 
Yeah, it's sitting very well with me. Okay. And so I'm thinking that there's a big educational element to all of this. Yes. So how are you managing through that? Well, we're giving informational pop-ups. So we have one scheduled this weekend, actually. We've been calling places, different senior centers and such, and sometimes they're a little resistant. So you're educating to the consumer, not to your potential wholesale purchaser. We educate, we go to B2B events, and but a lot of it is definitely like as we started, we started business to consumer and we're still educating consumers. At the end of the day, they're the ones who are going to be buying the products. They need to know like what's going on. Like They're spending their hard-earned dollars on CBD products. And sometimes it's kind of, I don't know, it's called heartbreaking, but it's definitely discouraging when I hear people say, well, I went out, I had this ailment, I bought some CBD from God knows where and it didn't work. That's like, well, wow, that's a negative to everyone in this business because she's going to tell 10 people that CBD doesn't work. Well, and I don't think you're the first business that's had that issue, but I think there's more stigma and question around the product to start with. I know unknowns maybe would be a better word. Right. What we're trying to do is destigmatize it, sort of separate it in people's minds from cannabis, at least as far as it can be separated. But also, we don't want to turn people off before they have an opportunity to see that it actually works. And I think for if I have advice for people who are maybe considering or even working with CBD products right now or using them, you know, if you feel like there's something that's not working for you, don't make this be your last stop. Like try something else. Even if you're not buying cherry blossom products, you know, we want people purchasing CBD and using it as opposed to some of the alternatives. I think it's a great, great, great product and a great way to naturally heal some of the things that we're dealing with right now, particularly pain, anxiety, and inflammation. They're all hot button topics we're talking about right now. So this education that we're talking about, is it helping you become more credible with the wholesalers you're looking at attracting? Because you're kind of doing part of their job then. If they're going to include it in their products and you're educating people, then they're more going to be more likely to buy their products. Exactly. And I think that especially in an area like ours where people don't always understand what we are doing or what our products are doing, they want to feel like they have an ally in this industry that they can trust. And they're someone who's willing to ask them questions and not just, I just want to sell you something to take your money. I th- I'll tell you what else has helped us is that we're calling other companies. I call other companies all the time and I'll just start talking about their products and see what they have. You never know. Like they may have something that you know one of my clients is looking for and I now have another resource for that. But also, just our business is a funny way, very open to sharing information with one another. I think we're all at a stage where we're pretty darn excited about what's happening and where this business is going. And, and we're just like talking and we're sharing knowledge. And hey, if I can you know, be a resource to you, it's unusual because I don't feel like I've had that as much in other businesses. Well, I think greater acceptance of the product overall is going to lift everybody up. Yes. So it makes sense. And I'm glad to hear that that's the case. I want to relate this back to people who are listening. And with you, Derek, it's kind of an obvious thing that education has to happen because there are so many fallacies and misconceptions about CBD overall. But I want to talk like you guys who are listening right now, sometimes we forget because we're so close to our product that there are things that our potential customers don't know. I'm going to go to something as basic as if you are a knitter and you're making scarves. Like, what are all the uses for the shapes of the scarves that you make to demonstrate or have a video that shows all the different uses or how to care for your scarves or, you know, whatever it is. Education, I think, brings so much additional value around your product and makes your product more and more attractive to your potential buyer. Now, with Derek and CBD, it's a way obvious example, but I want to swing it back to you also for thinking about your product and what might not be so obvious. Maybe you make a necklace that could also really be worn as a belt, (laughs) you know? I mean, just other ideas for you to use your product in a different way opens you up to additional sales. And it's funny you say that because it kind of goes with what we're talking about. It's like not necessarily being tied to your initial idea. Sometimes those new ideas are something you're already doing. Like you said, well, oh, I could just make this a little bit longer, make it a bell. It's, it's just bending your mind a little bit, kind of listen to your customers, and they'll tell you. They tell you what they want. They tell you what they're yeah. looking for. And educating your customers at the same and time. And educating your customers as well. Right. Okay, so... I'm quite sure you have a number of things you could talk about if I were to ask you about challenges, but I want you to pick one that you think for our audience would be really helpful. Like where have been the stumbling blocks along the way here? Grab the best one. (laughs) Oh, well, okay. 
the big one has been the vaping crisis of last year. 2019 was full of challenges for CBD and cannabis industries. But the vaping crisis, and it's not that we even sell vape products. It's just, again, the associations. It kind of sits in the same part of your mind, I guess. Yes. And then like every week for a while, it was something different. Well, it's these. Well, now it's the CBD ones and it's this. And it got to a point where it felt like everything was being tainted by like every time something came out in the news, like our business was being, our industry was being slightly tainted, slightly tainted. Were you seeing it in numbers? We're seeing it in numbers. We're seeing it in people as we were out doing farmers markets and things. And they were just like, no, nah, like this stuff is killing people or this stuff is killing children. Like, no, like that's not what's mm-hmm. <laughs> so- It's confusion. It's still confusion about the product because it's still so new. And then this is why, like, when people get bad products and now they're turned off and now they're not CBD advocates, it's like they're the anti advocate and it complicates the education issue. So, what do you do? You have to keep talking to people and you just have to keep educating them. You got to keep looking for different ways to sort of different that one bit of a nugget that's going to reach someone. And I'll tell you what happened at the candy show this year. We were, we were next to a young lady and her husband, great people. You can stop right there because they are also going to be on the show. Are they? Yeah, we're talking about Skip's Candies, everybody. So I think hers is going to be an episode. I don't remember if it's before or after you. But yeah, we've already done the interview. Such an interesting product as well. She is incredible. So this is who Derek's referencing, everybody. Yes. Okay. So Kim and Skip's, her husband's a police officer. And so I understood that there was probably a certain viewpoint, a certain perspective, right? Brings me back to that candle. So oh. <laughs> you're like the tie in, huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> Light bulb. <laughs> so we're talking in the three days that we're there. And she's okay, let me try some of this lotion. She does a mixed martial arts. Her shoulder and neck was like really giving her some problems. And I give her the lotion and she's like, you know, am I going to be hot? It's funny because like people will be trying the stuff and will be asking me sometimes, am I going to be hot? Like, no, you're not going to be hot. I asked you yeah. that when I tried to sample there because I had my wrist issue, right? Right. I remember that. Yes. It's, it's kind of funny because the back of my mind, I'm like, maybe they really want to be hot. No, so. <laughs> well, I'm not answering. <laughs> But I did say I do have a whole day of trade show to go through. <laughs> Should I take it now or later? <laughs> Well, I put this lotion on her and she comes back like 20 minutes later, like, hey, like this is working. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's working. <laughs> and I think by the end of the weekend and that we had to have enough conversation. And I think once I hit the magic note that when as I started this conversation, that these things come from different plants and that sometimes, yes, you can get CBD derived from marijuana, but most oftentimes it's derived from hemp. Ours is derived from hemp. And how effective it is, and it will not get you high. And once, like you say, the certain things to certain people, I think certain people want to hear certain things. And sometimes you got to keep kind of like, I'll attack it this way. And if I'm not quite reaching, then I'll I'll approach it from this angle, or maybe I'll approach it from this angle. But I guess my point, I want you to get it. Whether you use it or not, I at least want you to understand what's going on here. And it took her to use the lotion, and I think she got it. I dare to say she may even be a convert. I don't know, yet to say she hasn't ordered yet. (laughs) <laughs> but she might she just might it may take a little bit it's not as easy as getting people to buy cupcakes no it is not and sometimes like it would be a lot easier if the fda were allow us to put these derivatives in food and just kind of open that gate up because i think that would be a great door opener for people like most people are willing even though they act like they're not most people are willing to try new things and put them in their mouth they're willing to try new foods. They understand the pleasure of eating things and consuming things in that way. And I think once we can get there with that, I think we're going to have a lot of hemp oil conference. So back to the vaping just for a second. So really the strategy has to be carry on, continue talking, continue educating. Continue educating. That's it. Just keep talking. Mm -hmm. Keep having repeat conversations with people, especially I try to go a little bit extra when I feel like I think I'm challenging someone else's way of pain relief. I'll just leave it at that. But if I think that they're doing something other than this, and it's, I'm not a doctor, but I've seen what those things can do to people. And I'm like, hey, at least give it a shot. At least give it a try. And people have come back to us with success stories. Like my relative is using less of these because of this. 
I'm having more mobility without having the debilitating feeling uh, that these these pills give me because of this. I keep coming back to that example because it's such a hot button issue right now. And if this conversation helps one person get off of those pills, we've done a good job here today. So you've mentioned a couple of times here that you have exhibited both at more business to business shows, which is when we're talking about the Philly show, that's what we're we're talking about. But you've also done more local shows. What do you see, and there might be one that's more prevalent with one type of show than another, but what do you see as the best actions you take to get the best results when we're talking face-to-face shows now? Sampling is it. I I don't think a lot of people are getting a chance to sample as they go out. So sampling has really helped us tremendously. They see it. They see it on signs. They might see it in the store behind the case. But when they get to come up and like either taste the gummies or taste the tincture, so the oils, or we made actually chocolate sauce at the candy show to show some of the producers how easily this blends into chocolate without impacting taste. And when they taste these things and they're seeing it, it's like, oh, okay, it's a whole different thing. So you can see the the dots tie, coming together, you know, mm-hmm. explaining by demonstrating and sampling. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. You know, it always kills me when I go to a show that is an you know consumable show of some sort, right? And someone has cookies, but no samples, or they have chocolate, like no samples. And it's like such an obvious thing, but people don't do it. It's crazy. So I'm glad you brought that up. Now, some of our listeners don't have samples. They're not going to give away free earrings or (laughs) things like that. You know what you're getting when you buy an earring, or you know what you're getting when you buy a necklace or a piece of art, but you don't always know what you're getting when you buy consumables. Most of the times, you know what you're getting when you buy a sugar cookie, yes, but nonetheless, it doesn't hurt to, you know, to sample it. I think for someone who's actually, you're right, who's actually making food, you definitely want people to taste just how good your work is. It encourages them to buy it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what else, though, for those who don't have a consumable product, what other tip could you give us over and above sampling? Over and above sampling, I think the most important thing I see when I'm walking around that, because, you know, we, you go to, to your shows, you got to walk around and see what other people are doing. When people are sitting back at the booth and they're not engaging customers, I understand that half the people who walk by are never going to want to talk to you. They're, they may not be there for your mission, but you still have to be up and alert and engaged. I, when I see people sitting back on their phone, and sometimes you got to use your phone, but when you see 10 people walking past your booth and all the, the person behind the booth is looking at is your phone, what are you saying? Like, what message are you really communicating to the people at the show? I agree with you. It feels very closed off, too. It feels closed off or like you're disinterested. Like you feel like you're going to be interrupting them with their phone if you go in their booth. <laughs> exactly. People want to believe that you're interested. That's just like you'll buy something from someone if you feel their excitement about their product. Them on their phone shows no excitement about their product. Yeah. And I think these face-to-face events, too, allow you to show your personality and show who's behind the product. Like, honestly, Derek, I mean, I love the logo, all of that. If I hadn't been able to interact with you guys at your booth, I wouldn't have known what fun you are and how open you are. And we wouldn't have gotten into conversations and you wouldn't have had the opportunity to start educating me if you were that closed off. So the opportunity of being face to face allows your personality to come through too. And when people like you and have been talking to you, they feel more bonded and are that much closer to buying. I got to admit, even if I'm not in that booth, I got a good team. You do. They get it. They're energetic. They want to engage with people. They want to share the gospel of Cherry Blossom and, and what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. So I think we've definitely kind of all agreed that we're out there. We're out there on a mission. We want to achieve something. And what the heck is the point of paying all this money to go out there and present yourself if you're not trying to get engage people and get new customers? Let's move to another topic as we're starting to get near the end here. But something that I definitely wanted to bring up with you is pricing because it's still a new product. You've already talked about the fact that there are different levels of quality. So when you talk about people who are saying, oh, yeah, I've tried it, it hasn't worked, they might have also tried it at a price point that equated to the result that they got. I'm not sure. I'm making an assumption here. But how did you decide where you were going to price product that would be receptive to the market? I come the internet. And I was looking for similar container sizes, bottle sizes, CBD content, where like in milligrams. So, you know, different container count, like in gummies, you know, was a 30 count, was a 15 count. What were we looking at here? And making sure that I was comparing apples to apples on the market. 
I think one of the big points of confusion come in is when people don't understand the different oils, the different additives and things like that, that may make some of these products less expensive or more expensive than others. Sometimes it is the process or the type of processing that the hemp has gone through. It's just a more expensive process to get to the finished product. Sometimes that process creates a higher quality product. And we all understand this when we go to restaurants. If you're choosing the restaurant to go to on, say, on a Saturday night, you're probably not going to go to Taco Bell with your family. You're going to go to someplace nice and sit down because you already understand that you're going to get a higher quality product when you go there. Mm -hmm. I don't think the market truly understands that right now. Like where the higher quality products are and what makes them higher quality. Sometimes, like I say, it's a carrier oil. Sometimes it is, whether it's a difference between an MCT or a hemp seed oil or hemp oil, what have you, it could be, like I said, a difference in process. It could be the concentration. And that's a lot of conversation to try to have with someone in a short period of time. So how do you get someone to understand all that without them researching themselves? Kind of hard to, unless you're given a seminar. Well, they're not going to research themselves, probably. They're not. They're just going to walk away. They're just going to walk away. So it is that that is a challenge, like trying to convert people because sometimes because of the things they've heard or the stories or, like, oh, I didn't work or I got their minds made up, you mm-hmm. know, or maybe I'm a Christian and I think you're out here doing the devil's work selling this marijuana. I mean, and we've been told that, too. All these are, are just, just different perspectives and you just have to. And now I think we know what's coming at us and we're just better prepared to sort of challenge those and, and try to overcome those objections. Well, and some people flat out just aren't going to be your customer. You know, they're just going to decide that that is not for them, and that's fine. And we have to accept that, too, as business owners. Not everybody is going to be our customer. And that is okay. And that is okay. As we continue talking, I'm getting all of these, like, realizations, because just by the nature of your product, you're showing examples that are so extreme, right? Like, really having to educate the customer, Mm -hmm. that there are definitely going to be people who aren't going to be interested. Yeah. And there's a lot of variables in the senior market, which probably the senior market is probably buying more CBD and hemp. That market is very growing. It's very much growing. But those are the very people who remember the Nancy Reagan commercials and things like that. Or just like, no, nah, like this is all marijuana. Like this is agree with my ideology. And the younger people, they'll flat out tell me I'm not old enough to do CBD yet. Take that for what you want. But that's what they're telling me. (laughs) We're doing this now. When I get to the point where I can't do this, then I'll do this. In this particular market, in the Washington, D.C. market, I would love to take your products. I love that they're beautiful. I think they're probably effective, but I got to go to work and probably get tested. So any trace amounts of THC may end up with me being fired, which is a whole nother issue that we're trying to overcome because you can walk into work after drinking all night and that's totally acceptable. But if you have trace amounts of THC from taking a supplement that you did two weeks ago, then all of a sudden you're subject to losing your job. I mean, you've definitely got your challenges within the industry, but I think that the receptivity, the understanding is just going to continue to get better and better. Yes, I think so. I think it's getting out there. We're getting more and more specials and things like one hour, two hour specials on on the news outlets about it and different things coming out in different magazines and publications. So people are reading and I think people are understanding. So I think that's going to keep increasing, and I think business is just going to get better and better for this industry in the next five to 10 years, for sure. Yeah. So are you doing anything on the print side, like blog articles also to help support the cause? We say that we're going to, but it just hasn't happened yet. Okay. I think we need to get a little bit better about organizing our time. Well, you've got a lot going on. Hey, thank goodness for Larry. He really, really, I don't know what I do without that guy. He really helps hold it together. Oh my gosh. Yes, for sure. So where can our listeners go to learn more about you, see what you have going on? Well, we're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're actually editing videos right now for our YouTube page. So they're not quite there yet. We, <laughs> we've gone through a couple of editors that haven't quite found the right one. So, <laughs> so we're going to get some videos up soon. And we're and my, one of my, what I call drunk monkeys is like, I have to get over not doing videos. Like I somehow, I feel like I'm that teenager standing in the parking lot, taking pictures of myself. And I have to get past that. The more you do, the better you'll be. The more I do it, yeah, the better I'll be. I think that I have a lot to say as far as educating people on hemp. And I want to get people out there at least, if if not buying it, at least starting to educate themselves so they can make informed buying decisions. 
Okay. And I think we've already talked about the future. I think you're in an industry to keep an eye on. And you guys specifically, I have used your product. I love your product. Thank you. I only see it getting better and better as you adjust, twist, add, (laughs) change. I'm super curious about the packaging. Am I going to see you in September? You'll see us in September. And as far as the packaging goes... It's just, I think one of the big things that we did not like about the existing labels is that the writing, especially the supplemental facts on the back were too small. Even for someone with like childlike vision, it was still too small. So we understand that most of our customers are going to be probably 45 to 75. I'm already starting to have vision problems. So I can only imagine 20 years from now what some of our other customers may be dealing with or maybe 20 years or so ahead of us. So we had to do something about that. It was imperative that, that we got that writing bigger so they could see exactly what they're consuming. Well, and as you said, education is everything. And there are going to be times when people are handling a bottle and you're not around to talk to them. Exactly. But if you've got questions, you can email us directly at info at cherryblossomcbd.com or you can do a website submission. We're all over it. I think it comes with like one of two, at least two of us. So one of us is going to respond to you relatively quickly. Perfect. And Gift Biz listeners, you know, on the show notes page, I will have links to all the social media sites, the website, etc. So if you're out walking the dog, folding your laundry, doing whatever you're doing at work behind the scenes, like listening, no problems. I've got you covered over in the show notes. Derek, super interesting conversation today. I understand the whole CBD concept way better than I did in the beginning. Thank you. Good, good. So it's been such a help and really, really good business insights, as I referenced earlier too, kind of augmented. Things that we all should recognize that we can encounter, but augmented for your industry. So I really appreciate your sharing with us today. Thank you. I found this chat with Derek to be so valuable. First, we all now have the real facts about CBD. But by nature of Derek's product, he faces challenges that we all have as business owners, except his are magnified tenfold, given the restrictions and the uneducated opinions about CBD. I'm so happy that he was willing to share how he's working through all this to gain customer acceptance. Most of our products never encounter these obstacles, but his solutions can definitely be applied for each and every one of us. Up next week, I have the perfect business to share with you, just in time for Easter. Make sure to tune in to learn more about how this business continues to grow without any social media. You heard me right, zero social media to date. I bet that sparks your curiosity. A great way to ensure that you don't miss this is to subscribe to the podcast. When you do, every episode will be ready and waiting for you each and every week. Now, as one final reminder, I want to just make mention one more time that Classroom Doors close to Makers MBA tomorrow night. Go to giftbizunwrap.com forward slash Makers MBA for all the details. There is really no more time to wait. 